Hi, welcome back to the Dozen Debrief. I'm Dozen, and today we're gonna to be talking about the speed of sound. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about Mach 1. All right, so what is the speed of sound? How fast is that? And it's important to understand that that is not a specific number. It completely changes depending upon the density of the environment that you're working within. If you think about it this way, if you have a gaseous air that where molecules are spaced very far apart, when the sound wave from one molecule goes, hits another molecule, bounces off that one and goes to the next one, that transition can take a while, so your speed of sound is actually quite a bit slower. Now if you take that into a liquid, for example, say you're in water, well those molecules are much more dense and so the compression from one to the other happens a lot, lot faster. And so you're looking at about four times the speed of sound in water than you would have if you were in the air. The density of the air that you're going through has a big impact on the speed of sound, on what Mach 1 means. So if you think about it in this scenario where you are close to the sea level and it's a very cold day, say it's zero degrees outside and you're at sea level, that air is going to be very dense because one, you're at a low altitude and two, it's gonna be dense because it's a very cold temperature. So you're gonna to have to be going much, much faster to get to the speed of sound as far as miles per hour goes or knots go. Say you're at 50,000 feet and the air is pretty thin because you're higher up in the atmosphere. Well, now your Mach speed, the amount of knots or miles an hour required to get to Mach 1 greatly decreases. As you increase your speed and you get closer and closer to that speed of sound, you get closer to Mach 1, what happens is those air molecules start to compress and you start getting a lot more resistance on the aircraft to the point where back in the day they thought that there was a wall there and that when you hit that speed where you were traveling as fast as the sound is going, there was gonna be so much aerodynamic drag on the aircraft that it would literally rip apart any aircraft that was trying to go through that. One thing about the speed of sound that's interesting to talk about is that we don't say two Mach, one Mach, two Mach, three Mach. We say Mach one, Mach two, Mach three. And one of the reasons for that is that it's a dimensionless quantity. So it's not a unit of measurement in the way that uh, feet per second or miles or hour is because it totally depends on, like we said already, the medium that you're going through. So because of that, we say that whatever medium you're in, we're gonna call the speed of sound Mach 1. Now, if you're going twice that speed, now you're at Mach 2. Mach 3, Mach 4, you start getting the hypersonic speeds, Mach 5, and we can talk about that later, but that's how Mach is defined. And it's just interesting that we don't say one Mach or we don't say two Mach, and that's why. I think the first example of humanity creating something that goes faster than the speed of sound is a bullwhip. So if you think of a whip, right, Indiana Jones style, and he goes and he hits the whip, that crack that you hear, that is actually the tip of the whip traveling so fast at the very end, it snaps, and that snap is actually traveling faster than the speed of sound, and that's why you hear that big pop, because the tip of that whip is actually compressing the air so much that it's breaking the sound barrier. And so that was really the first invention that went faster than the speed of sound that man ever created. So here we are, we've created bull whips, we've got a name for it. Now we've got people that are flying aircraft faster and faster and faster against this theoretical wall where aircraft are going to break apart if they go into it. Well, who beat it first? It was Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager back October 14th, 1947, broke the speed of sound. Now, because of the classification of everything, it wasn't actually released at the time, but he flew the X-1 aircraft. They put an X-1 aircraft on the bottom of a B-29 aircraft, right? Think World War II, going across the channel, big radial engines, carrying this jet aircraft up to altitude of 25,000 feet. They dropped him out of this, and then he rocketed past the speed of sound for the first time in human history. So for about a year, nobody in the world other than those in the super classified project even knew that he had busted the speed of sound. All right, so a lot of you that are at air shows wonder like, oh, this person has all these cones and these vapors that are coming off the back of it. Is it going supersonic or is it close to supersonic? Uh, and the answer is not really. So what you have to take into consideration is as the aircraft travels through the air, there, it's pushing air that it's going through. And as it pushes that air, if there's a lot of moisture in the air and that air is compressed, it creates a cloud, it creates moisture, a visible moisture. Uh, so you see these sweet cones that are, that are happening behind the aircraft. Where you get compressibility to create water moisture, or at a faster speed, where you get to go faster than the speed of sound, varies on the aircraft at different spots. We generally say an aircraft is Mach 1, or past the speed of sound, when 
the entire aircraft is traveling so fast that it is traveling faster than the speed of sound. So let's talk about going supersonic. Uh, obviously we do it in the military all the time. Modern fighters, pretty much all of them go faster than the speed of sound. Uh, if it has an F designated in front of it, it's probably supersonic. Even this little T-38 built in the 1960s, that's a trainer aircraft, this thing goes supersonic. So why do we go supersonic? Why is it important for aircraft to go fast? Can you chase down another aircraft? Yeah, that's good. Uh, but in modern warfare, uh, the way that we design things is designed beyond visual range. We call it BVR. What that means is that we'll have good guys on one side, bad guys on the other, and they're using their radars to see each other. And they're using these missiles, short range, medium range, long range missiles uh, to shoot at each other. Well, you want to take your missile, your stick, your spear, your javelin, and you want to throw it as far as possible. Well, how do you throw it as far as possible? You want to try and get high into the thin air, and you want to try and get faster than the speed of sound. Well, why? Because when you transition from subsonic to supersonic, there's that wall that you have to get through. Between 0.85 to 1.2 uh, on the Mach, it requires more and more energy to get past that point. But there's a funny phenomenon that happens once you get past about 0.12, it actually becomes aerodynamically a lot easier to continue going the same speed. There's a big pressure that happens at that transonic region, but once you get past it, it's actually easier to go faster. And so if you can get your aircraft in thin air and going super fast, past the speed of sound, and then you throw the missile, now all the rocket propulsion that's in the missile can use that energy to get faster, 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 and doesn't have to use its energy to get past the speed of sound. All right, so a lot of people wonder what it's like to pass the speed of sound, right? When you pass the speed of sound, what happens, right? Uh, if you've seen the movie The Right Stuff, right? The, I think the canopy starts glowing purple and unicorns pop out and there's glitter in the cockpit all of a sudden. No, it's not like that at all. Honestly, because it is just a relative number, all that happens is you see on your gauge, it went 0 0.98, 0 0.99, 1.0, 1.01 and it's a little underwhelming. There's no boom that happens in your cockpit because you were actually traveling faster than the speed of sound, so there's nothing to catch up from you. And so from the pilot's perspective, it's completely straightforward. You just see a number that says 1.0 or greater and that's it. So it really doesn't matter if you're cracking a whip or you're in a supersonic jet fighter, the concept's the same. You are compressing air so much that you are passing the speed at which the sound can travel. That's pretty cool. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions about aviation that you wanna know more about or you want us to cover, go ahead and drop that in the comments below and we'll see what we can get to. So like, subscribe, talk to your friends about it, share the information, and we'll see y'all next time. So I did my F-16 training out of Holloman Air Force Base and on every Friday, you would see the pilots would fight, they would do their dog fights, and at the end of the day, uh, when they had a little bit of gas and they're on, their, they're on their way home, they would like to uh, ride over top of the field, point straight at the field, uh, because the um, altitude restriction for going supersonic was, was 10,000 feet, which is pretty low. And they would go straight down to 10,000 feet, recover, and they would send this massive shock wave down to the ground. And we'd be sitting in class in academics or something like that, and the whole building would just start shaking from that sonic boom that these aircraft had uh, sent down to the ground.